Father, I pray that our hearts would bow before your sacred word and not fault it, but fault ourselves. And I pray that we would be granted to embrace the terrible reality of your wrath and judgment and never, never, never take it into our own hands as your church. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. So, Father, train our minds in the reality of your wrath and awaken our affections to fear it and forbid that we would ever, ever take it into our hands as your church. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The name of this series is Thinking and Feeling with God in Psalms, and we're in part five in this message, and there will be, Lord willing, six. We have dealt with the feeling of spiritual depression in Psalm 42 and how to be discouraged well, and we've dealt with the feelings of regret and guilt in Psalm 51 and how to feel remorse well, and we have dealt now in the psalm we just sang, Psalm 103, with the feelings of exultation and gratitude and praise and how to do that well, especially as fathers, since that message was preached on Father's Day. And now the question is, in this Psalm 69, what do you do with the feeling of rage and anger when you have been horribly wronged? Maybe sexual abuse in your family? Maybe blatant racial discrimination? Maybe the murdering of your spouse? Maybe the betraying of a marriage vow, leaving you totally and unexpectedly with your life on its head as you never dreamed? These are uh, a group of psalms called imprecatory psalms. It's a fancy word. It means psalms in which the psalmist prays down curses on his adversaries. God, don't save them, damn them. That's the way he prays. That's in the Bible. That's in that psalm. Blot them out of the book of life. Let them find no acquittal from you. Don't let them be enrolled in the number of the righteous. And these psalms generally are considered a problem because Jesus said, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who abuse you. Pray for them, not against them. So let's take Psalm 69. Psalm 69 has in it the longest section on imprecations in the Psalter. So I'm taking the hardest one that I could find. And let's ask whether it's a problem, whether Christians can read it, let alone next week sing it. I'm eager to see how that happens. We are singing the Psalms in the week after I preach on them. Have you noticed? So we will sing, I hope, wherever Chuck went, we will sing 
Dan, Rick, Chuck. Psalm 69 next week, Lord willing. So the key is this. What does God's inspired New Testament make of it? Nothing? Like, whoa, let's avoid those. This psalm is quoted, seven of these verses are quoted in the New Testament. This is unbelievable to me. Including the imprecatory parts of the psalm and not just the other parts about the suffering servant or anointed one or righteous one. So it seems from the New Testament that in no way are we to run away from the imprecatory psalms. Rather, it looks to me like the New Testament loved this psalm. Jesus lived in this psalm. It carried him to the cross and through the cross manifestly. This is not an opinion that Piper has. You will see it very plainly before we are done. Jesus lived in this psalm, loved this psalm. Paul loved this psalm. Peter loved this psalm. They all quote this psalm. Why are we stumbling over this psalm when the New Testament appears to have zero problem with this psalm? That's the question. So let's get an overview of the psalm, and then we will ask how the New Testament reads it, understands it, applies it, and how should we feel and think with God in this psalm. So the the overview. David feels overwhelmed by his enemies. You just heard that. They don't appear to be military enemies. They appear to be personal enemies. They're heartless. They're vicious. He doesn't claim to be perfect. That's a remarkable thing. Since many of the Psalms hold David up, don't mention his sins, but he wouldn't let that go This time he says, verse 4, more in number are the hairs of my head, as the the hairs of my head are those who hate me without a cause. So the hatred that's coming to him isn't caused by his sins. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal must I now restore. But in verse 5, He says, you know the wrongs I've committed. But this hatred coming at me is not because of those wrongs. This is not a Bathsheba issue. These reproaches that are coming on me now are undeserved from these people. I have not done anything to deserve what I'm getting from these folks as far as they're concerned. So what's at stake here is the glory of God. He is receiving reproaches because he stands for it. Verse 7, it is for your sake, O God, that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. Verse 9, zeal for your house, O God, has consumed me, sound familiar, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me, sound familiar? In other words, his suffering is not only undeserved, it is endured precisely as a representative of God. The reproaches of those who reproach you, God, have fallen on me. When God gets reproached, I get reproached because I'm his representative. I'm standing with him. I'm standing for him. And and the reproaches coming to me are really reproaches that are directed at him. And so he pleads, verse 14, he pleads for rescue and salvation from this miserable situation. Deliver me from sinking into the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Verse 18, draw near to my soul. Redeem me, ransom me because of my enemies. And then come 
verses 22 to 28, and they are entirely imprecations or prayers that his enemies be cursed. God's enemies, his enemies, that the full force of God's judgment fall on them, that they not be acquitted. Verse 22, let their table before them become a snare. In other words, when they sit down to eat, may their supper table be a trap. And when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. And then he closes with a cry for help, verse 29. But I'm afflicted in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. So here's the summary. David is not a perfect man. He confesses that in verse 5. He is a righteous man. He implies that in verse 28. He's a man who loves the glory of God. He trusts God's mercy for ransom and redemption that he needs. He stands up for the cause of the humble, verses 32 and 33. And he's suffering undeserved persecution because he's standing with God and the enemies of God are making him their enemy as well. And in the middle of all of that, lament and cry for help, seven verses are devoted to crying down the judgment of God on these people. There's the song. Now, what does the New Testament make of, of this? Well, the first thing we should see, we've noted already, let me say it again, is that in all of its quotations, and this psalm is quoted as much as any in its extent, not as many times, but more of it, I believe. In its quoting, it's never embarrassed by this psalm, ever. Not a hint that, ooh, we need to correct this psalm or be embarrassed by this psalm or be critical of this psalm or leave it behind and get beyond it. The New Testament never treats it as a sinful, personal vengeance. So we learn from the New Testament that, and this is what we should expect given what we saw in the first message, that Jesus regards the Psalms as inspired by God. And therefore, this psalm is holy. I was naive at age 25 and easily shockable theologically. And in Germany, was in a conference and in a seminar with a big square table. I can just see it. I was so jolted by this moment of my studies. And sitting around that table were high-level scholars from all over Germany. I had never seen real Bible-rejecting theological liberalism in action. I had only read about it. And I was there as an observer, graduate student. And in the discussion, one fairly innocent young man quoted one of the imprecatory psalms to make a point. And across the table, he was sitting about that angle from me, a well-known scholar got this look on his face and simply burst out, Das ist doch ein Pharisäer Psalm. That is a Pharisee psalm. Clearly implying don't ever quote that psalm around us. Don't ever quote those psalms around me. You leave those out. That's what liberalism is. It leaves out parts of the Bible. It is liberal in the sense that it feels free to do what it pleases with God's word. I sat there just almost trembling. I had never in public 
heard Bible scholars treat the Bible that way. It's, it's much more subtle in evangelicalism. But there it was not subtle. And inside, everything in me said, I'm here studying to teach the Bible. Oh, God, never, never, never let me go there. Never let me be influenced by this kind of blasphemy. And I think, I pray, I hope that he has protected me and will yet. So the New Testament would not have approved of that attitude. Das ist doch ein Pharisäer Psalm. The New Testament quotes this psalm in two ways, mainly. There are other ways, one other way, but we'll just take two, the main two. It quotes this psalm as words of David, And it quotes this psalm as words of Jesus. Let's take those one at a time and see what they imply for us. Number one, I'm going to go to Romans 11. This is the longest quote of the psalm in the New Testament. The psalm that's quoted, I'll read the psalm first and we'll go look at it in Romans 11. The psalm goes like this in verses 22 to 23. Let their table before them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. That's what Paul read and Paul quoted the entirety of it in Romans 11. So he's praying, the psalmist is praying that that their food become poison for them and kill them, Uh, that their table be an undoing, that their bounty, which they think is good, prove to be their judgment, and that they be blinded so that they cannot see and escape judgment. That's what he's praying would happen to these adversaries of God and himself. Especially... Look at verses, uh, you're in Romans, I'm I'm still looking at the psalm for right now, verse 27, second half of the verse. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. So clearly he's praying for their damnation. Okay. Now, you would think that if this prayer is a sinful, personal prayer, Vengeance that the Apostle Paul would at least avoid it and possibly correct it, and you get exactly the opposite. Not only in chapter 11, but in chapter 15 as well. So in building Romans, he goes to this psalm twice, not just once, and he goes there significantly and not just accidentally. He does just the opposite. He runs to this psalm, not away from it, and he goes straight to the hardest part of the psalm for us. Now, here's here's what's going on in Romans 11. Think back several years. I know there's no use in you thinking back several years, but we were there once upon a time in Romans 11. And what he's doing is saying that, by and large, the, the mass of Ethnic Israel has rejected Jesus as the Messiah. What is God's response to that? And his response is to give them over for a season to hardening until the full number of the Gentiles comes in. That's the point of Romans 11 in large measure. The Jewish people, not all of them by any means, and we should be evangelizing Jews all the time. In the hopes that God, if by any means, might save some. That's what Paul laid his life down. My prayer to God for them is that they might be saved, he said in chapter 10, verse 1. And he spent his life going to synagogue after synagogue after synagogue, preaching the gospel. And we should do the same to every Jewish person we know with great love and sacrifice. However, the Bible teaches in Romans 11 that one of the reasons there are so few converts is because for a season most of them are under a judicial hardening from God. That's the point of Romans 11. And in order to support it, he quotes this psalm. 
me give you the tip off in verse 7 of Romans 11. What then? Israel failed to, to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Similarly, verse 25 Lest you be wise in your own sight, it's talking to Gentiles now, to us mainly. There are Jewish people in this room, I know some. He's saying to Gentiles, lest you be snooty about this and wise in your own sight, I want you to know and understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. And then it's going to change. May it change soon. Now, in that context, verses 9 to 11, he quotes the psalm. And he says, and David says... He's simply giving biblical warrant to what he just said. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So, how does he interpret David? As a sinful vendetta against personal enemies? No. He interprets David as a reliable expression of what happens to the adversaries of God's anointed. A reliable expression of what happens to the adversaries of God's anointed. David was God's anointed king, being rejected, persecuted, reviled, reproached, saying the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on Me And now the son of David comes into the world, Jesus Christ, and he too is rejected. What happens to those who continue in rejecting the Lord's anointed? Answer, they will be damned. And it will be right that they be damned. And we will approve of their damnation. And it is fitting to want that to happen. Paul does not hear emotional words of retaliation in David's voice. He hears sober, prophetic words of judgment that God's anointed wills to bring his adversaries into judgment. That's why he quotes these words in Psalm, in Romans 11, to make that very point. The adversaries of Christ, the Messiah of God, are going to be darkened and hardened as part of God's judgment. So that's the first way the New Testament quotes this Psalm. They quote it as the words of David, giving expression to what will become of those who bring reproaches upon the Lord and his anointed impenitently to the end. Second, the New Testament quotes this psalm more often as the words of Jesus. And here it becomes amazing to me because it implies how Jesus so deeply lived in this psalm. He's the son of David, and the reason they quote the psalm, and he quotes the psalm as his own words, is because what the original king and anointed one and David did was a foreshadowing of what the last David and the last anointed one, Messiah, will complete in fuller measure. And so he took it as his own. Let me give you four illustrations. Number one. John chapter 2, three of them are in John, one of them's in Romans. So we'll look at, the, we'll look at John 2, 13. You don't know the story. Jesus is driving out the robbers from the temple. Actually, they don't think they're robbers, and he's driving them out. In verse 16 of John 2, he says, he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away and do not make my father's house a house of trade. Now that phrase, my father's house, Very important, and his disciples are watching this happen and listening. He said, my father's house. And they're watching what he did, and he's so 
hangry. He looks like he's been being eaten up by zeal. And as soon as they saw those words and made that connection, bang, Psalm 69 is in their mind. They know their Bibles. These are Bible-saturated people. Psalm 69.9 is quoted in verse 17 like this. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So in David's words of zeal for the temple, and then they watch Jesus with passion and zeal driving out these pigeon sellers and saying the very words of the psalm, and they knew, whoa, this is Psalm 69 in fulfillment. Number two, John 15, 24 Jesus is being hated by the leaders of the people. And this time, he explicitly quotes Psalm 69 as part of God's law. Remember, five weeks ago, we talked about the man who meditates on the law of God, and we argued that law meant instruction. Here's a place where law in the Old Testament refers to the Psalms which shouldn't surprise us once we know that it means instruction. If I had done, I'm at John 15, 24, if I had done among them the works that no one else did, if I had not, I'm sorry, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father, But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause, which is a quotation of verse 4 of Psalm 69. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. So Jesus himself is aware of David. He lived in this psalm. He watched David unjustly persecuted and he watched what would become of such people in judgment and David's approval of it and his desire for it at a certain time. If there were time, I'd go into the patience of David. It's not in this psalm, but in the imprecatory psalm 109, it talks about how long David loved his enemies before he prayed this way. So Jesus is watching that, then he watches the things around him, and he's structuring his life in a living out of this psalm. Number three, this is from um, at the cross, and it's going to be a quotation from Psalm 69, 21, and the text is John 19, 28. John 19, 28 to 30. The psalm had said in Psalm 69, 21, they gave me poison for food and for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. What did David mean by that? We don't know. He doesn't give us the situation. Somehow his adversaries were acting in a way that brought him to say, they gave me poison for food and my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. And Jesus so, I mean, here's where it becomes almost incredible, that Jesus now is hanging on the cross, okay? This is the worst way of dying that there is. You don't think when you're dying this way. You scream and you try to breathe and you... How in the world do you live according to a psalm when you're hanging on the cross? Unless it was in you. It was you. So let's read John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture. 
a thirst. A jar of, full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine on his branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The last act in the fulfillment of an imprecatory psalm. Not the way you would have written it. According to the apostle, Jesus died fulfilling Psalm 69. What more glorious tribute could you pay to a psalm? It doesn't get any higher in my book. The very psalm that we consider a problem... Jesus lived in so fully that in his last agonizing, he fulfilled. Last illustration, number four. This one is from Romans 15. And it's a quotation of verse 9. The reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me, it says in the psalm now. I wish I could take you into all the highways and byways of my thinking over the last days and years. Here's Paul in, in the beginning of a chapter where his burden is that Jews and Gentiles who have different eating patterns and drinking patterns and Worship patterns welcome one another and don't please themselves privately, but try to please others. That's the issue. <laughs> Where in the Bible would you go to support that? An imprecatory psalm? <laughs> yes. Verse 3, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up for Christ. Here I am now, verse 3. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. He's making use of the psalm to encourage a behavior that doesn't appear to be in the psalm. The psalm seems to be going the other direction. <laughs> Think, hmm. So, here's the way we'll try to gather it all together. I'm going to close with uh, three observations. How then should we think? How should we feel? As we deal with this Psalm 69 and what the New Testament makes of it, I have three, three answers, and here they are. Number one, we should deal with this psalm as a divinely inspired voice of David, God's anointed, suffering for the glory of God, expressing his desire for and approval of God's judgment on the unrepentant adversaries of the Lord, He's making plain that God's judgment does come. It's right that it come. It's desirable that it come. There is desire, divine judgment coming. And uh, when it comes, we will approve it. So the first thing I want us to feel is God is just. And he's wrathful. And judgment's coming. And everybody who has been resistant to the Lord's anointed and not repented and let his sufferings break them into repentance will perish. This church believes that. We're not, we're not a soft theological church. There is steel in this Bible 
And though in America today, we may be a soft people, we are a very mushy, soft people, the days are coming when you will want a theology with steel in it. And all the happy feelings won't be happy at all when blood flows as high as a horse's bridle you will think differently about justice than when your biggest problem is an air conditioner that doesn't work so the first observation is this is inspired this endorses wrath this says wrath is good this is I want wrath to come in its appropriate way so he's saying I want it. number two We should hear David as foreshadowing the ministry of the Lord Jesus. What David experiences as the Lord's anointed, Jesus is going to complete. As the greater Lord's anointed, no no sin in Jesus. That's why you can't make the parallels exact, right? That's why we invent words like typology. David was a type. Jesus was an anti-type. And the type is not totally like the anti-type, but overlaps, and he's a lot like it, and the fulfillment of the type completes the type, and so Jesus is greater. How is he greater? That would be the question. For those, here's the way I'm putting the pieces together of the Bible, for those who see the suffering of the Lord's anointed, whether it's David or Jesus, and are glad about it, join it, make it worse. Everything David is saying is right to happen to them, ought to happen to them. I will be glad when it happens to them in the age to come. However, for those who watch the Lord's anointed take unjust suffering, like Jesus hanging on the cross, this is why the gospel is so powerful to break people and to make Christians and believers out of them. When when we see that suffering, and we know it's because of our sin, and we break nothing that David prayed for, nothing that David prayed for is going to happen to us. Listen to this amazing word from Romans 2. This captures so much. It's uh, both and not either or. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Isn't that an amazing Everything Jesus did in his years on earth was to commend God's kindness to us and to demonstrate that his wrath would be willing to fall on him and not us if we would go to him and hide in him as the one who took our place. But the other effect of this kindness is if by our hard and impenitent hard heart we turn away from it, we are storing up for ourselves wrath which will be revealed on the righteous day of wrath. It cuts both ways, aroma for life and aroma for death. Finally, number three, third way of of responding to this psalm. What about us? What should we think? The main thing to say, I think, about the imprecations is that they are not encouragements or incentives to curse our enemies. Now, they're not. In fact, in Paul's mind, the psalm takes us in exactly the opposite direction. In verse 3 of Romans 15, this psalm is used to encourage us to deny ourselves and not to gratify our lust for revenge or selfishness. That's the function of the psalm in Paul's mind. 
Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now, what's the reason that in Paul's mind, the psalm would have the effect of producing non-vengeance? The reason is not that Paul slices with his penknife wrath portions out of the Psalms and out of the Bible. Okay, we'll get rid of that. That's just ein Psalm. We'll get rid of that. We'll build our own Bible, and then we'll stay Christian and, and have a Piper Bible or a Paul Bible, or I could name a few names. No, that's not the reason that he thought that this psalm produced non-vengeance. He believed that this psalm produced non-vengeance because, well, I'll just read it to you. This is Romans 12, verses 19 to 21. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. Never avenge yourselves. Leave it, not to wrath that doesn't exist, but real, terrible, horrible wrath. Leave it. Leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, Give him something to drink, for by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Hmm. Hmm. I don't think those burning coals are simple. I think they're double. If you love your enemy... You're doing something very glorious, very beautiful, and very dangerous for your enemy. Because if they repent, broken by your love, these coals will prove to be burning contrition. But if they don't, the coals of your kindness will multiply the heat of their hell. You don't have the luxury of not being used by God for life and death, for heaven and hell. You don't. You will serve both if you are faithful. We will approve either one in the end. And that's what the psalm makes plain. If we are not broken by the suffering of the Messiah and his followers, then they will approve of our judgment. But here is the main practical outcome. Jesus would say it this way. Paul would say it this way. Because wrath belongs to the Lord and it will, be it will be done and it will be right and it will be good. Because of that, don't dare ever, ever take it into your own hands. No ethnocentrism. No anti-Semitism. Only lay your life down Jesus-like love. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. And you will be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Gracious Father, wrath and judgment are weighty, weighty matters. 
The Bible is a weighty book. The cross is a weighty moment. Hell is a weighty reality. We will not be trifling people. Grant, I pray that we would live these things and say these things in a way that would commend them to people who have been blown away by horrible injustices and know there must be wrath or God is not just. May we have a word for them that it's coming, but they don't have to do it. They don't have to seethe all their life long with bitterness. They don't have to burn inside with a self-destructive rage of revenge. They can hand it over to him who judges justly and know that at the last day, if their abuser has not repented, they will look with approval on his damnation. Oh God, give us a strong redeeming word for everyone. The abuser because of the cross and the abused because either the cross or hell. You are a great Holy God, we tremble before you and we bow. In Jesus' name, amen.